Kia ora, folks. Let's look at some standard derivatives and rules for combining some derivatives, and we'll go through examples of each. The first one I want to talk about is the constant rule, and all this says is what's the derivative of a constant function. So we have here if f at x equals c, then the derivative is 0. Now how do we plot f at x equals c? Let's just do a quick sketch here. So f at x equals c, pick a c value. Looks something like this. And then if we try to come along and calculate the slope of any two points here, well, it's a flat line, horizontal line, the slope is always going to be zero. And so that is where we get the derivative equals zero. So any constant always differentiates to zero. And if you want to apply the power rule, you can do that. We'll get to the power rule in a minute. So f at x equals five, f prime at x equals zero. f at x equals pi. Remember pi is just a number, 3.1415 five, nine, uh, two, six, five, and it keeps on going. Uh, so as a number, well, it doesn't really matter that it's pi, the derivative here, f prime equals zero. The first rule we will look at for calculating derivatives is called the power rule, and the power rule applies to any type of polynomial or any type of function that has an exponent in it as long as there's not any special cases. So we'll start with the easiest version of the power rule and we'll go from there. So here I have d by dx, which just means notation for derivative with respect to x. And then I have my function x to the n where n is some constant exponent. And the rule says that the derivative of this expression is n times, so we take n, we move it down in front, and we multiply it. And so that's where my n comes from, n times x, and then to the power n minus 1. The new exponent here of the derivative tells me that I lose a degree every time I differentiate. So if you started with y equals x cubed, the derivative will end up being a quadratic or an x squared function. Okay, so f at x equals x to the power of 5. My derivative here, then I take the 5, I bring it down in front, so 5 multiplied by x, and then I need to modify the exponent. So in this case, it's 5 minus 1. Simplify this to 5x to the power of 4. And my degree now it went from 5 down to four, so that went from a fifth degree down to a quartic, or a degree five down to a degree four equation. Okay, three x to the minus four, so it works with negative exponents as well, just follow along. F prime at x equals negative four, and then we have to multiply by what's already there. So I'll keep the three, and then x to the minus four, and you subtract another one from that. So when you subtract from that negative, you get more negative. I'll simplify here to minus 12 x to the power minus five. And so again, the degree of that equation has diminished or gone down by one. So we'll introduce some radicals or some root functions and we see that this power rule works the exact same way. So here I have square root of x. My strategy here is going to be to rewrite these. So 
So I want to rewrite as an exponent. So the square root of x is the same as x to the power 1 half. And so that'll be my function, f at x. And now I will differentiate this using the power rule. So the 1 half comes down in front, keep it as is. And then x and my new exponent is 1 half minus 1. This new exponent, when I simplify, I like to think of it, if it's minus one, I like to think of it in this case as two halves. So since I have two in the denominator, I go one half minus two halves to make sure that I get to minus a half. And perhaps you could rewrite this in a different form if you want. You could take the x down to the denominator and I get one over two square root x. So you can check that. My next one, oh, I won't do the derivative just yet. I'm going to rewrite this. So six, I'll just leave out front as is. And now instead of a square root, I have a cube root. So a cube root is exponent one third. So I'll take a few steps here to rewrite this. So that's x to the power seven, right? Everything underneath the root. And then that whole thing is to the exponent one over three. And now I can use exponent rules here to combine these. So that's just seven times one third or seven thirds. Six x to the seven thirds, and I'll leave it as a fraction. Do not write it as a decimal in this case because you'll lose some information with that third in there when you write it as a decimal. Okay, so my derivative, let's use the power rule, f prime, take your exponent down in front, so seven over three times six, and then my new exponent is seven thirds minus one or I think of it as 7 thirds minus 3 thirds. And that way you already have a common denominator and you won't get mixed up. So 7 times 6 is 42 over 3. And then x to the power 7 minus 3 is 4 thirds. And 42 over 3, you might want to simplify that as well. Um, or reduce that down as well. I'll just leave it for the moment. Other properties of derivatives are pretty common for all of algebraic systems. So we're going to look at when you add two functions together, so f of x plus g of x, and that's going to be called the sum rule. Negative here or subtract will be the difference rule, so f of x minus g of x and then multiply if we have a constant times a function, c dot f at x, or c multiplied by f at x, what do we do? So I can write these out in general. Remember my d by dx here just is notation for derivative. And using that notation, you can distribute this inside the brackets, okay? So in general form, this is d by dx f at x plus the derivative of g at x. And so you can calculate those independently and then add them together. So the same thing for the difference rule, you can calculate your derivatives independently and then just subtract the result. If they combine together, they might not. The constant multiple rule tells me that actually this constant, I can just 
bring it out front and park it. So I can say this is the same as C times, and then the derivative notation again, and then f at x. Now it doesn't look like I did much here, but this can help you because the derivative now is just this box here, and it might be a little bit easier to calculate that derivative. So here I have a polynomial expression with three terms, and I can use the sum rule for the plus, the difference rule for the minus, and the constant multiple rule for the three, the five, and the seven, and then I can combine them all together. So let's maybe take one step to write those out and then combine them together. So f prime is going to be three, and then times the derivative just of x to the power four, plus five times the derivative of x to the six minus seven times the derivative of x cubed. Now you don't have to write these out every time, just illustrating here how you can break this down. And then I can use the power rule here, right? This becomes four x cubed. This becomes six x to the power five. X cubed becomes three x squared. And now I'll multiply by my constants plus five times minus seven times. And you can simplify the coefficients out front. So 12x cubed plus 30 x to the 5 minus 21 x squared. This one looks a little bit different and what we can do is we can see that we have a function times a function but none of the individual pieces are strictly constants, right? So a constant C in this case would just be a two, but here I have a two and an X. So that tells me that this little piece is its own function. And then this piece is another function. So that'd be multiplied by another function. So I can't just use the constant rule there, but I can use another trick from algebra and I can just clear the brackets. So let's go ahead and do that, 2x, and I'll do this one first. This looks like a difference of squares. So that would be x squared minus one. When I clear those brackets, uh, and then one more, 2x, cubed minus 2x. And now I'm ready for my derivative. Here it says find dy by dx. So that's slightly different notation this time. So I can just write derivative of y with respect to x equals 6x minus 2. So that's using the power rule my three came down in front times the two equals six. And then this one here, I have an unwritten one there, an unwritten one here. And when you do one subtract zero, sorry, when you do one subtract one, you get to zero. X to the power of zero equals one. And so you're just left with two. So maybe I'll write that down as an aside. So if we have f at x equals 2x, f prime then using the power rule is two times, we take this exponent one, move it down, and then we do one minus one equals zero. 
one minus one, two times x to the power of zero, and that equals two. Okay, I'm asked straight away to simplify and then differentiate. And I can see that this doesn't look like the previous examples. And in fact, I have a function on top. I know because I've got x's. And I also have a function on the bottom because I have an x in the denominator here. So one way to do this would be the quotient rule, which we will look at later. Um, but another way to do this is that I see that I've got x's in every term. So what I can do is factor. So let's just take out a single x from every term. So I'm left with 2x squared minus 4x cubed plus 3x all over 2x. And now we can cancel these x's, one on top and one on bottom. And then what I can do is distribute that 2 inside all of my terms. So I'll have 2 over 2 in my first one. Then I'll have minus 4 over 2 in my second term. And then I'll have 3 over 2. in my third term. Okay, so that's still just my original function. So the derivative, using the power rule, is 2x minus 3 times 2x squared plus 3 halves. And you can maybe simplify in the middle there to a negative 6 but that captures all of the information in that derivative. Moving on, let's look at the exponential function now. So here's the graph of the exponential function. Um, f at x equals e to the x. And we can see here the special point e to the power 1 is 2.718281828 and so on. It's an irrational number, so this decimal number keeps on going and some information about the domain and the range. So an exponential function does not fall under the polynomial terms we were looking at previously because the variable is now in the exponent. So it has a different rule for its derivative. So if I have my function f at x equals e to the x, then the derivative actually is itself. And I'll just sketch a few tangents on the graph here. So if I calculate the tangent here, the slope at this point represents the derivative. And at this point, the slope indeed is going to be just over positive 5. And so then I would plot it over top of that point I just drew. If I calculate the slope here, it's going to be just over 1. The slope right at 0 is going to be 1. And so at every point, the slope is equal to the value of that function. And that's why e is a special number or a special function. That's why e has its own button on the calculator. And that's why e is always used to model exponential growth and decay because of the properties of its derivative. So what does this mean, practically speaking? How does this look? Well, let's just write a quick example on top here f at x equals 7 times e to the x. That's my function. The derivative now, 7 turns out to be a constant multiple out in front. So this will be 7 times the derivative of e to the x. And then I look at my map and I say, oh, hang on, e to the x has its own derivative. And I will sub in e to the x, so this equals 7, this derivative then is e to the x, and I'm done. And these two are the same. All right, so that looks a little strange, but if you think about the graph, 
that derivative graph goes right on top of the original function. Okay, the inverse of an exponential function is a logarithmic function, and the inverse of e, which is the natural exponential function, is the natural log. So ln is the next one that we will look at. And so if we have our function here, f at x equals log base e, which equals ln x, then the derivative is just going to be the inverse, 1 over x. And so that's another one that we will use right now. Okay, find f prime and g prime. So f prime, we have 3 times the natural log of x plus 2x squared. So this one we just looked at, the derivative here, d by dx, ln x equals 1 over x. So that's my standard derivative here. So this is going to be 3 times that derivative, 1 over x. Plus, and now I'm using the sum rule, I still have to find the derivative of 2x squared, but I can use the power rule. So that's plus 4x. And you might want to simplify, but you might not. 3 over x plus 4x is my del derivative here. OK, g prime. So e to the x is itself, so I don't do anything. There it is. That's my derivative, e to the x. Um, 1 over x cubed, I could rewrite this as x to the power minus 3. And then I could find the derivative, so d by dx of x to the minus 3. And now I can use the power rule, minus 3 x to the minus 4. So I'll sub that in plus minus 3 x to the minus 4. Next up, 5 is a constant multiple out front, so I can park it there and then have the derivative of the natural log x is going to be 1 over x. So you might want to rewrite this, e to the x, whoops, that next one's a minus, minus 3 over x to the 4, uh, minus 5 over x. All right, polynomials, constants, exponents, logarithms. The next type of function we've been looking at is trigonomic functions. And trigonomic functions have kind of uh, the sine and the cosine have some interesting derivatives. We can see them here. Sine has as its derivative cosine. So sine differentiates to cosine. And then cosine differentiates to negative sine. So they kind of come full circle back around on each other. Tangent is the special one, that's the odd one out, and it differentiates to secant squared of x. Okay, let's look at this. So y equals 4 times sine of x minus 2 times cos of x. So I've got some constant multiples here, the 4 and the 2. And then some trig, sine and the cosine. So my derivative dy by dx, the 4 you just leave it, 4 times, and then the derivative of sine is cosine of x minus 2, and just park that 2, and then the derivative of cosine is negative sine x. So I have a double negative, I'll simplify with one step, 4 cos x plus 2 sine x. And then a tangent one here. I can rewrite this as t to the power minus 1 plus tangent of t. So my derivative, now this is f of t, so I'm going to write f prime, oops, not x, that's exactly what I didn't want to do, f prime of t 
keep your variables to match the equation. t to the minus 1, this is a power rule. So this will be minus t to the minus 2. And then tangent differentiates to a new trig function, and it is called secant or sec squared of t. So I'll just make a note here that sec stands for secant. And this is a new trig function that we haven't seen yet. Let's just take a quick look at some of these trig derivatives. So I can type in y equals sine x, and then y prime equals, oh, and I cannot type y prime, I have to use function notation. So I have to say f at x equals sine x. And let's change my graph to be in radians this looks a little bit better and let's change the y-axis compress it a bit or stretch it a bit okay so there's my sine graph now the derivative of sine is supposed to supposedly cosine so that means if you plot all of the slopes you can imagine plotting a slope here it's zero so the slope plot will go right up here plotting a slope here is zero there's a tangent line that would plot right here. And you can plot all of these and we see this oscillating behavior. And the derivative now, it looks like, well, let's, let's plot it. It looks like it's kind of either lagging behind or slightly in front of the sine function. So let's plot it in a dotted line as the derivative. So if sine starts at the origin here, it looks like the derivative is kind of behind it or you zoom ahead and it's in front and it still has this oscillating nature to it. And if I replace sine, let's also do cosine of x. We can see now that cosine, oh, I need to give this a new letter, g. We can see now that cosine, the red one, is right on top of the derivative of sine. So indeed, the derivative of sine is cosine. Okay, tangents, they're a really weird one. Let's have a look at tangent. So here I have tan x. Tan of zero is zero. And then tangent, now let's change my graph a bit now. On the y-axis, I want to go down to like 30 and up to 30. So tangent has this behavior where it goes up to infinity and then it comes down to negative infinity. And as after it gets to positive infinity, it kind of wraps around somehow and comes back up from negative infinity. And these lines at pi by two are asymptotes. So at x equals pi by two. So this line here is an asymptote. And so is all of the other multiples. So negative pi by two, and so on. So these dotted lines will never be seen by the function itself. So if we think about the slopes, right, we're talking about derivatives. If we graph the slopes of this tangent function, well, if you've got a piece of paper, you can sketch out tangent and then imagine and sketch out the slopes as well. So the slope down here is positive. It's almost going straight up and it's a really huge number. So the slope down here should be plotted way up here. And then as I come up following this line, somewhere in here I have a slope of one. And so the tangent here has a value that's decreasing. So it's steep and it's some big number, maybe a million. And then by the time we get to here, it's like one. So it started way up here and it comes down. And then by the time my tangent line comes back around here, it stays positive the whole way through and now it starts getting bigger again. And so let's have a look. So f prime at x is the tangent 
is the derivative. Now let's go orange. So the orange one is the derivative of tangent. And we can see just as we predicted, it starts out big, it comes down to some value and then it increases again and goes up to something big. And that one, this one here is called secant. Sorry, this one here is called secant squared. That's the derivative there. If I do g equals secant of x, we can see what secant looks like and compare it to the derivative here, which should be secant squared. So that we can do a little test here. h equals sec x and it is squared. And so this red one should be right on top of the orange one and indeed it looks like secant squared has that behavior. One other interesting thing to note here is secant has some negative quadrants here and by the time you square it for the orange one for that derivative they all become positive right because any negative number squared will become a positive value.